This video concerns a great address given in 1830 by Daniel Webster on the floor of the U.S. Senate. It's famously referred to as Webster's reply to Hain dealing with the impending or um, eventual civil war which would take place in the United States. And you'll actually notice um, the civil war still doesn't break out until 1861. So this is actually, th you know, 31 years before um, the outbreak of the war. But here are two figures illustrations that show the United States growing as a country over time. There was a previous video that talked about how um, the Missouri Compromise basically um, allowed slavery south of the line here, um, but not north of it with the exception of Missouri. And really we, again, still have these two different ways of life that are emerging in the United States. We have a way of life in the north, which can just be described as um, really industrial. This is my new pen, so apologies if it's not very good. Versus of the south, which is more agrarian. That slide's a little bit better. And um, relies really on the institution of slavery. So what actually happened? Um, here again, we have the United States again at the time, and it's growing, and it's continued to move westward. We have new states such as Wisconsin, such as Iowa, and such as Texas. And the question is going to be, if we go back again to this line, that famous Missouri Compromise in 1820, is how will these new states align with the national interests? Will they be more favorable to the northern states, which vote, um, you know, mostly in unison with one another, not always, but generally speaking, they have the same agenda moving forward, or will they um, side more with the southern states? at the time. And this guy, John C. Calhoun, has an idea. And he is currently vice president at the time to President Andrew Jackson. These two don't get along, but that's a whole nother story. And he has this guy named Robert Hain, who he is going to, um, he serves as a pupil for um, John C. Calhoun. And John C. Calhoun is going to tell him uh, kind of what to say on the floor of the Senate one day. So again, we have increasing divisions between North and South over slavery, but also tariffs. And, um, you know, this video is not going to cover it, but there was questions of if the federal government imposes tariffs, do the states have a right to enforce them? And the big question, again, is if Western states, new states allied with the South, they could protect their way of life in an increasingly divided nation. Hain will argue that states' rights should, again, be the rule of thumb, and um, states' rights will obviously play a role in um, the government but then the question is to what extent really um so i'll kind of write that here to what extent do states rights play a role um how much power do they actually have given their um their limitations in the constitution and then daniel webster of massachusetts will give one of the most famous replies um in senate history but we have to go back because part of this um speech is also going to evolve um the the way of life in the South, which again, consisted of slavery at that time. So it's important really quickly, just briefly to talk about the evolution of slavery and the way it was referred to. If you go back to um, the founding fathers and, you know, the, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, most of the founding fathers, whether they were slave owners or not, and majority of them were, they really thought that the institution would die out over time. And they would really weren't probably wrong for thinking so. Um, you know, in 1776 at the time, you know, slavery is mostly concentrated in still um, the Jamestown, Chesapeake area, and also um, some of the deeper southern states. But, you know, um, there still wasn't the massive technological increases in the ways that slavery could be developed. And that happened later on with um, institutions um, or uh, devices such as the cotton gin, which all of a sudden made the South a absolute paradise for harvesting cotton. You know, um, the cotton gin doesn't come into play until later on. So again, most people thought slavery would die out. Um, slavery, again, equals money. And the way that slavery will be characterized and the way that it will enter the national conscious or the dialogue will change. Whereas before, you know, Washington and Jefferson, Jefferson famously said, Slavery is like holding a wolf by the ears. You don't like it, but you don't want to let it go. But that will change increasingly. Um, John C. Calhoun will start to characterize slavery as a positive good and will say that slavery is not new to the United States. And in fact, it's one of the oldest institutions in the world. It's good for both races, both for white and for black races. Um, 
So we're starting to change slavery. We're starting to um, dangerously kind of, you know, um, justify the institution. And this is going to be important because um, how will new states like Texas, you know, eventually area that would become Oklahoma, you know, how will they respond? Will they also align with Southern interests, thereby protecting the institution? Or will they speak out against it? Well, Hain argued that the states should, you know, do what the, the states want to do. Webster will give a famous reply, though, um, from Massachusetts. Daniel Webster, one of the great orators of the time. Um, here is the famous painting, Webster's Reply to Hain by James Boyd. I think this painting is hanging out in the Senate. But he's going to really say, I think he speaks for like two days. Um, but he's going to really say three things that are really, really quite prophetic. The first is that the people of the United States have declared that this constitution shall be the supreme law. This goes back, and again, the video didn't cover it, the idea of tariffs. And some southern states were saying, we do not actually have to pay these taxes. We don't have to do it. It's going to hurt our interests as a state. Because again, lots of times, especially um, in many southern states, there was this idea of, I'm from my state first. My country comes second. You know, I'm a South Carolinian. I'm, then I'm an American, but more importantly, I'm a South Carolinian and I don't want to pay a tariff that's going to hurt my state. Maybe it'll help my country, but it will hurt my state. But the second thing is um, really, you know, Webster, again, this is 1830. This is 31 years before the Civil War starts. He is starting to see everything that is building up as a potential barrier to the North and the South ever coming together. He's predicting war. He says, and he warns prophetically, when my eyes shall be turned to behold for the last time the sun in heaven, may I not see him shining on the broken and dishonored fragments of a once glorious union. He is saying, let not war break our union. We must resolve these differences. And then he has some of his most famous words enter into the U.S. conscious, liberty and union now and forever one and inseparable. These were um, textbook phrases that kids needed to learn growing up in time. But he is again saying, you know, let's say we have um, uh, 13 free states and um, 11 slave states. Uh, it is always important to keep these states together, not let them run asunder. But what we'll see later on 31 years is his prediction um, about a potential war will come true, but he delivers this great oratory and it really did have an impact, especially the people in the in the gallery, but also on some of the Western states. And um, from my understanding, many of them did shift their allegiances to, at that time, more of the Northern states. And the, it was printed everywhere and it becomes this famous address and famous rallying cry, probably one of Daniel Webster's greatest moments.